Well, hey, welcome to Compass Online. My name is Anthony. I'm the executive pastor here at the Compass Church, and I am so glad that you have joined us here today for our Palm Sunday service. In just a few moments, our worship team is gonna lead us in some great singing where I invite you to participate, sing along, regardless of where you're at. Maybe you're at home, maybe you're in your car, keep your eyes on the road if you are. Maybe you're with a group of people or by yourself, wherever you find yourself today, I invite you to worship along with us here in just a few moments. You know, as Easter Sunday is coming up, coming up in just a few short days next week, I encourage you to invite somebody to come to church with you, whether you're uh, attending online or you're gonna be at one of our in-person services. This is an amazing time, an amazing opportunity to invite someone to come and to celebrate Easter with you and with your Compass family. You know, as I think about Easter, I'm reminded of how not too long ago, my wife and I, we uh, had a friend that we had met through our kids' school and through our kids' sports, and we had the opportunity to share with her what our faith meant to us. And so we extended the invitation for her to attend a worship service with us uh, with no strings attached. And she came and she saw what the gospel was all about. She saw what church and a community of faith was all about. And by that invitation, she accepted Jesus as her savior. And in turn, her family became believers as well. And so think about what that may mean for you this year, this Easter. If you extend an invitation to somebody that you know, maybe it's through your kid's sports or your kid's school, or maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker, they're more likely to accept an invitation this time of year than in any other time of the year. And so take a step of faith, go out in faith and invite somebody to attend the Compass online or in person this Easter. Well, hey, I invite you wherever you're at to sing along as we worship God here on Palm Sunday. This week, we're gonna be celebrating Palm Sunday. And that's the kickoff to Holy Week that uh, ends with Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And I love that God builds in these cyclical reminders of the beauty of how He set it up when Jesus came to earth, what He did, His sacrifice for us. And Palm Sunday is a time when we remember that when He entered into Jerusalem, He entered as a king, as the hope of the world. People shouted Hosanna, which means God saves. And so we're gonna sing a song right now that celebrates our Hosanna, our Savior. This song, it gives us hope. So let's sing with this hope in our hearts.
everybody. Are you ready to finish our series called He Gets Us? This is week six in our study of the greatest teaching planet Earth has ever seen. Jesus Christ came not only to save us from our sins and provide a way to be reconciled with God by dying on the cross, he also came to teach to teach about life. And he knows what we're going through. Do, you do remember that he became one of us, right? As a human and as the maker of humanity, nobody understands how to do life better than Jesus Christ. And so what have we learned? Let's, let's go back, shall we? Do a little review. Uh, week one, we saw that Jesus gets insecurity. And then Jesus gets exhaustion. And then week three, anxiety. And then guilt. Grief was last week. And today, Jesus gets dissatisfaction. What we're really looking at here is this topic of desire. You know, we, we find ourselves desiring more in life. We're dissatisfied. And Jesus speaks to that. Friends, today I come to you from a wonderful gourmet coffee roastery called I Have a Bean. Not only does this place make the best coffee around, it is also a ministry that we've been in partnership with for many years. This ministry was started to employ people right out of prison. We got a real heart for everybody in prison and want to help any way we can when it comes to getting out. And sometimes that's a tough time to get a job. Well, this is a good place for those out of prison to find meaningful work. And man, they make the best coffee. You know, I'm here with all of the beans where they're delivered from Central America, South America, and only the highest quality of beans will do. From here, they take the beans over into a $75,000 roaster that roasts them to perfection and then cools the beans off and then they're weighed in bags and sealed and shipped off for people's great enjoyment. Coffee, mmm, wish you could smell what I'm smelling right now. You know who loves coffee? You talk about desire, my wife loves coffee like no one I've ever seen. <laughs> she wakes up in the morning and she's like, coffee, I need my coffee. She is a woman on a mission and she makes her way to the kitchen where she takes her beans and grinds them. And then just the sound of the grinding beans seems to bring a smile to her face. And then the, the sound of the brewing as the water filters through and the aroma, oh, Jen can't wait for her coffee. In fact, if you get in her way when she's going after her coffee, pity you. You will be in trouble because you talk about desire. She is consumed with a desire for this stuff. What do you think about desire like that? Is, is desire a good thing? Turns out that the Bible celebrates desire. No kidding. In our passage today, we're going to see Jesus asking. The word he uses is, are you thirsty? He's in a great public celebration in Jerusalem among thousands. And in an uh, elevated platform, he shouts, anybody feel thirst within? And then he says, come to me because I will satisfy that desire. Jesus calls us to understand and feel and lean into desire. You know, that's rather special. Christianity is uniquely celebrating desire. It turns out that other religions often view desire as an evil thing, something to be avoided. Here, I got a little story for you. Uh, talk about desire. I do not like musicals. And my wife, back on Valentine's Day, she said, Jeff, I want to go to the Chinese dance-themed musical called Shen Yun. I had not heard of it, but she was so excited. Sounded like pure torture to me, but I love my wife, and so I bought tickets for Valentine's Day. 
uh, way more costly than I felt comfortable with, but when you're in love, you know, you'll do funny things. So. It was just a week ago, finally, that we went to our show, and we arrived, and I'm watching the dance, trying to stay awake and enjoy it as best I could. But as the program was going through, we, we noticed religious themes, not good religious theme, not biblical truth, but religious themes of a sort. And as we got towards the end of this program, it was painfully clear that we were at a propaganda event trying to sell a brand new Chinese cult. No kidding. And I looked at my wife and she's like, oops, sorry. I'm like, what are we at? And as we left, there's these members of the new false religion trying to sell their sacred book written by their new founder who's still alive today. I'm like, no thanks. You know, I'm thinking, I've already invested enough money in a cult for one day. Well, Jen and I got in the car and we started reading about this religion called Falun Gong. And as we read, we discovered that one of its central tenets is to abandon desire. They, they teach that longing for things is no good. The, the, the path to contentment is to not want anything. Isn't that fascinating? As it turns out, Buddhism is similar. A lot of religions downplay desire, while Christianity says, no, it's a God-given gift. Identify desire. Lean into it. Desire, in fact, dissatisfaction with life is like a homing device designed to propel you in a search until you find what you're looking for in Jesus Christ himself. And so friends, let's dive into Jesus' teaching on dissatisfaction. He understands it. He created it to be a blessing. So again, let's, let's study Jesus Gets Dissatisfaction. All right, friends, we're going to be studying out of John chapter 7, starting in verse 37, where we read, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Friends, this is so fun. I want to really try to lean in and imagine this profound moment. First of all, what do we see context-wise? Well, it's on the last and greatest day of the festival. What festival? We're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. Every year, the Israelites would celebrate a whole week. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles was. Seven days in Jerusalem. In fact, they'd sleep in tabernacles or booths or tents. They were portable tents that were camped all around the countryside surrounding Jerusalem. Thousands of people for seven days. It was an amazing celebration. And in it, they commemorated the wandering in the wilderness. You may be aware that after the Jews escaped their slavery in Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering in that wilderness before they entered Canaan, the land of flowing with milk and honey where they set up their uh, new country of Israel. So those 40 years were formative in the establishment of the nation of Israel. And on the last and greatest day, there was a ceremony that was of great significance and connection to what Jesus says. On that last day, we learn that the high priest would take a pitcher of water Actually, he'd fill the pitcher at the pool of Siloam and they would bring it up to the temple where they'd pour it out as, as a commemoration of God providing water. Turned out that part of the wandering in the desert was when in Rephidim, there was great thirst. The people had no water and they thought they were going to die of thirst. But God provided water miraculously out of a rock, a rock at 
Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, just burst open with water flowing. And the people said, we can never forget the Lord saving our lives by providing water. And so this last day, this march would take place again from the Pool of Siloam up this road to the temple. It's about a third of a mile where they would uh, commemorate God quenching their thirst. Turns out that archaeology has done a lot uh, that relates to this moment. In fact, let me just tell you, first of all, the Pool of Siloam, where the high priest would fill the golden pitcher, that was excavated, oh, about 20 years ago, 2004. And so here they find the Pool of Siloam, and then maybe 10 years ago, they started to discover the road. There was a road paved by King Herod back in the first century that went from the Pool of Siloam to the temple. Mount. And this was the road that these people would walk in the sacred parade of celebration. Uh, it's been a challenge for them to excavate it because there are people who own homes that have built, been built over the road. You imagine 2,000 years of debris and conquering where they, the Romans in 70 uh, AD, they destroyed Jerusalem, knocked it down, would have covered the road that had just recently been built. And so the people can't buy the houses to excavate, so they've actually tunneled underneath these homes, and they're excavating the first century road along the way. And as they did it just recently, they came across this uh, stepping structure that they call a speaker's podium. It's the best guess that they can make that there was a place where as people were parading along that road, celebrating, among other things, the provision of water, a speaker, a rabbi who had an official position of rabbi could stand and make a speech. Friends, we don't know for sure, but I'm convinced that's where Jesus said this. It was on that day when they were celebrating and marching along that very road that Christ cried out, so are you thirsty? Jesus says, come to me. Can you imagine Christ proclaiming to that parade on that day this message of he being the answer to the, the thirst within? I love it. Well, as we look at this text, I want to draw out three lessons for us about thirst, that inner desire. What will satisfy our dissatisfaction? The first lesson I want to draw out is embrace your thirst. Again, in that passage, we see Jesus saying, come on, anybody thirsty? You got to be thirsty. Christ is wanting them and us to get in touch with our thirst. As said, unlike Hinduism, Christianity wants us to foster that desire. Desire is a great thing. And so I challenge you, don't Try to just get mellow. Don't try to say, oh, I want to be content, and so I'm just going to go about. No, no, no. If you have angst, dissatisfaction, that's a gift from God. Fan it into flames. You know, think of this. If, if you had a business trip that separated you and your spouse for two weeks, and uh, you were reconciled or reunited, and you asked your spouse, did you miss me? Would you want them to say, Curiously, no, I didn't miss you at all. I didn't even think of you. No, you'd want them to say, I missed you so bad. You know, there's a sense in which we're separated from God. We're reconciled to him, but we don't see him face to face as we were meant for. We don't hear him audibly as we were originally meant for. And so there's this longing. We know we were made for more of God than we presently have. And we should get in touch with that longing. We insult him when we say, I don't miss you. No, if there's a problem regarding desire, it's not too much, it's too little. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, he said this, there's a prayer, a number of prayers actually, in his book called The Pursuit of God. And in one of the prayers, he says, Lord, I'm ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh, God, I want to long to be filled with longing. He says, I thirst to be made thirsty, to be made more thirsty still. Isn't that great? Do you pray that prayer? 
Do you say, oh Lord, light a fire of desire for you in me. Awaken my sleepy heart. I want every day to yearn to know you better, to seek your face, to build a closer relationship with you. If we will cry out for God to help us embrace our thirst, we'll be served well by that growing passion to know our maker. So that's the first. Embrace your thirst. The second is understand your thirst. In that passage, Jesus says, all of you who are thirsty, come to me and drink. I draw emphasis there. Come to me. Jesus is announcing that I know you're thirsty, but don't be fooled by your thirst. What you need is me, Christ says. The, the downside of dissatisfaction is that it's easy to be fooled. Many people have been fooled, assuming that something other than God is what they're longing for. In fact, in, in Jeremiah 2.13, God says this, These people, they have forsaken me. The spring of living water. God says, I'm the spring of living water. And these people, not only have they forsaken me, they've dug broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Isn't that interesting? The Lord says, people, what are you looking for satisfaction and other things for? You, you were made for me, God says. I'm the fountain of living water. I, I'm what you thirst for. Do you know what I mean? People say, oh, if I were only wealthy, if I was only successful, if I was only married to that beautiful person, if I only had kids who were perfect, if I only owned a house like that, well, all the time. Our, our lives are filled with misplaced desire. We long for things that are mirages. You know what a mirage is, right? If you're in the desert and all of a sudden you see a mirage, the sun is tricking you. I don't fully understand. It's like heat rising off the sands. I don't get it. But it looks like a cool, cool pool of water. And desert travelers have been known to run after a mirage, convinced that that will satisfy the thirst within, only to get there and to discover it's dust. There's nothing there. There's no substance. All hope, no delivery. And so it is with the things of this world, you know. People get stuff, and then they realize, ah, I thought that was satisfied, but it doesn't. I have a friend who at one point was trying to buy a house up in Lake Geneva, and it was a, it was a summer home, a vacation home that he dreamed of for so long. He had put in an offer significantly below asking price, but it was all he could afford. And I remember him telling me, Oh, Jeff, I can't handle this tension. He says, I have never wanted anything in all my life as much as I want that house. I remember just going, oh my, that's not good. That's ugly. He has set his hopes on that house satisfying the, the desire within, but it's a broken cistern. Maybe for a time, a week, two months, it would thrill him, but it leaks, it drains away, and God, and God alone, is the one we long for. In Psalm 4, starting in verse 6, he says, Let your face smile on us, Lord, for you have given me greater joy than those with abundant harvests of grain and wine. How about that? David, David, who knew what it was like to have the stuff of this world, what he wants is more of God. Lord, I want to feel your smile, your love, your delight in me. I know there are those who are trying to find happiness in having lots of wine and grain. David's like, been there, done that. I know you are what I long for. And so when Jesus says, come to me, friends, this is, us understanding our thirst. What are we really thirsting for? What will really satisfy? People were made to be in friendship with their God. And until we find more and more of that connection, relational connection with God, we're going to be miserable. So let's see. We've seen two things. First, we need to embrace our thirst. We need to understand our thirst. And thirdly, we need to follow our thirst. 
Let's go back to our passage. I'm going to read verse 37 and then move on again further to verse 38. It says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, Jesus says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And so the satisfaction that Jesus is promising, it's an inner movement, and he describes it as a river of living water. Not not just a little bit. We're talking gushing river of living water. Interestingly, river of living water is something that we find In the book of Revelation, I think Jesus had this in mind. Revelation 22, verse 1. This is speaking of John's vision of heaven, what heaven will be like. And this this mountain called the New Jerusalem, a city built on a mountain. In In this tour of heaven, it says, The angel showed me a river of living water flowing from the throne of God down the center of the main street. Oh, that's interesting. So in heaven, the capital city will be this new Jerusalem. God will be at this throne at the summit of this mountainous city. And from his throne will flow this river of living water. And it says that the River goes down the center of the main street, which is confusing, but you've seen a divided highway with a grass median down the middle. Instead of a grass median, that's the river. And so on either side of the river, people are traveling all the time. It's the main street, the main expressway in heaven. What does that tell us? That the main travel in heaven is along the river that goes where? Where's the source? The throne of God. (laughs) The main travel in heaven is to be with God, to pursue him. And how do you find the way to connection with God? Follow the river with the water of life. Friends, uh, follow the river. Follow your thirst. That same travel along the river right to the Lord, that is part of the great supply that God gave back in Uh, the deserts back with the uh, Israelites who escaped from Egypt. Remember, this was all a celebration of God providing water out of the rock. Maybe you noticed that I said that the people of God were at Rephidim, but the source of the water was a rock at Mount Sinai. They were separated by miles. How then, if the water came out of the rock at the mountain of God, How did it get to the people at Rephidim? Let me show you. Psalm 105 verse 41 says, The Lord split open a rock and water gushed out to form a river that flowed through the dry wasteland. So in the case of the Israelites, they were headed to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Moses has said, people, I want you to meet God. It's the best thing going. And on their way, they came to a place of thirst, Rephidim, where they thought they were going to die of thirst. And then God did a miracle where a river started at Sinai that flowed to them. And so they drank from this new river. And then when Moses said, all right, let's continue on our way to Sinai, the people would have said, well, we know how to get there now. Just follow the river. It'll bring us right to the mountain of God. So In the desert, they follow the river to meet with God. In heaven, we'll follow the river to meet with God. When Jesus said, are you thirsty? Come to me. The the idea is that the river of life, our thirst, will guide us. God made us thirsty to guide us to connection with him. Uh, Even as the uh, pilgrims were marching up to the, the peak of the Temple Mount, They were pursuing God. And Jesus says, you're doing the right thing. Pursue him by coming to me. Friends, our thirst is like a guide. Uh, I I said it before, I'll say it again. A homing device that propels us in search of the Lord. The great thing about longing for him more, remember, embrace your thirst. You long for him more then you can follow that thirst. It will serve you as a guide, helping you not just long for him, but helping you 
find him. You see, and the goal is not just to long for him more, but to encounter him more, to know a sense of his nearness, to experience an awareness of his love for you, to have a sense of his voice speaking, not audibly, but to our hearts. We were made for this encounter with God. We have it in part in this life, full in the next life in heaven. But even though it's in part now, it's still the sweetest thing in this life. So go after God. Let that desire for him propel you every day to read the word, to seek him in prayer, to hear his voice and follow it throughout the day, to recognize his beauty as reflected in his created world. Every day we should have this pursuit of God. You know, even uh, this week I was... (laughs) I listen to probably too much sports radio. I don't know if that's your thing. I was in the car listening to sports radio. You know what they were talking about? The NFL draft. Bears fans, we know that we have the best draft position maybe ever. We got the very first pick and the ninth pick. One and nine, one and nine. I mean, that's all we've been talking about for three months. In fact, we'll be talking about it until... That draft, which is at the end of April. I got a little weary of it. I mean, you can speculate only so much on what the Bears are going to pick in one and nine. And I got to a place where I'm like, ah, that's enough, that's enough. I don't want to hear it anymore. And I turned off the radio. And then I felt this, I need God. And I, I'm still old school, (laughs) put in a CD of worship music And as I drove, songs lifted my heart to celebration of my heavenly Father. And that little shift of getting weary of the things of this world that promise much and then disappoint, Bears fans, (laughs) and shifting to this great connection with our almighty God, a celebration of him being the greatest thing going, and one who is accessible through Jesus Christ. Friends, that shift, that's what it means to follow your thirst. To wake up in the morning and say, God, I thirst for you. I need you. I want you. And to pursue him in response to that thirst. Friends, we're made for the Lord. He's everything. In fact, this closing prayer is going to be a chance for those of you who may not even be right with him to get right with him. You know, Jesus came to earth to die on the cross as payment for our sins so that we can be made right with God, the purpose of life. And so if you've not trusted in Christ and been reconciled to your maker, believe it or not, this closing prayer is a chance for you to do just that. Pray with me. Lord, uh, the dissatisfaction, the ache within, we now get it. We know what we thirst for. It's you. And so for some, we're placing our faith in Christ. We're saying, Jesus, if you came to die and make a way for us to get right with the Father, we want to walk that way. We, We yearn, we yearn to be right with you. And so in this moment, We say yes to the offer of reconciliation that Christ you extend. Be the forgiver of our sins. Be the leader of our lives in this moment. Out of nothing we've done, but fully trusting in you, Christ, as the rescuer. We want to be rescued and brought to God. Uh, Lord, in this moment, we are placing faith in, in Christ as Lord and Savior and seeking salvation, forgiveness, and reconciliation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Those of you who prayed that prayer, brilliant, most important thing in life. One more verse. It says in Psalm 81, 16, God speaking, he says, I can satisfy you like with honey from a rock. Oh, that's good. Not only did God provide water to quench our thirst from the rock, But God says, I'm so satisfying. It's like a dry rock would provide honey, uh, sweetness, delight. The song we're about to sing celebrates just that. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey. For the living will Only you can 
challenged with that message. I hope that you were encouraged by the worship. I hope that you were able to participate and worship with us here today. And you know, one of the ways that you can let us know that you worshiped with us today is to fill out that connection card. Uh, there's going to be a QR code that pops up on your screen. You can just follow that code. Let us know that you were here. Let us know how we can be praying for you this week. Maybe uh, you want us to pray for you as you extend an invitation for someone to attend with you next Sunday as we celebrate Easter Sunday. Let us know that you were here by filling out that connection card. You can also give online anytime, day or night. Uh, you can go to our website. You can automate your giving so that you can stay faithful with your giving regardless of what your schedule is over the coming weeks. And be sure and be with us either on Good Friday or Easter, maybe both, as we have two great experiences that we've prepared and that we're believing that God is gonna work through those services, whether it's here at Compass Online or if it's one of our in-person services. You can find all of the service times and locations on our website anytime, day or night. We hope to see you in the coming days.